What is up, all of my beautiful freaking people? Welcome back to another episode of FML Talk. Today, we are dancing with the motherfucking stars, y'all. Cheryl Burke is here, two-time Mirrorball champion from Dancing with the Stars. So sit back, grab your dancing shoes, and welcome to FML Talk. Oh my god. Wait, how old was the other girl? 19. Can you believe that shit? Hey, this is Gabrielle Stone. Good book. I did not just understand that. Oh, he did what? 48 hours? What a dick. Yeah, but have you seen all the photos on her Instagram? And this is FML Talk. Oh no, she didn't. Y'all know I love a good self-love cocktail and occasionally an actual cocktail. I have always notoriously hated the taste of alcohol and needed it disguised in a good mixology cocktail until I discovered Neft. Because Neft is a premium vodka in its purest form with non-GMO rye, it has a light taste full of character. Not only is Neft one of the best tasting vodkas I've ever had, it also comes in the cutest packaging I have ever seen. Their unbreakable barrel keeps it chilled for up to six hours, making it the perfect drink to take just about anywhere. Join me in adding a little actual cocktail into your self-love cocktail with Neft Vodka. Cheers! If y'all were unaware, I grew up as a dancer. It was my passion. High school dance shows are like the, the highlight of my life. I hold them dear to my heart. Those were like the golden years. Um, so I have always been a really big fan of Dancing with the Stars, love the show. And I recently connected with Cheryl Burke when I went on and did her podcast, Burke in the Game. And we quickly found out that we have a lot in common, including our addiction to Latin men, uh, recovered addiction (laughs) from Latin men. And I was like, you have to come on FML Talk. Her story is incredible, insane, sad, exciting, amazing, all of the above. When we first recorded this, she didn't know who her partner on this new season that's currently going on now was going to be. And it was revealed recently that it was Sam Champion, who is an award-winning journalist and newscaster and her old friend. So I cannot wait to watch them on this season. Although when this episode airs, I think it will already be well into the season. I do want to preface this episode with a trigger warning. We talk a lot about body dysmorphia. We talk about her past uh, addiction. And we do get into some abuse in relationships. So I want to blanket trigger warning this episode for all of those things. But we do, it's a really fun girl talk episode. And I can't wait for you guys to hear it. So... Without further ado, here is Miss Cheryl fucking Burke. Cheryl Burke, welcome to FML Talk. Thanks, I'm so excited. I'm so excited I to have you here. I feel like I've known you forever. It's like I weird, said. right? It's We're very like, weird. We're like kindred sisters like from another lifetime. You know, I, I feel like once you go through shit men experiences, yeah. like you're automatically connected in a yep. different way. Yep. I absolutely fell in love with you doing your show, um, Burke in the Game, and... Like, we have so many weird similarities, but I have to be honest, like, my first experience with you, obviously, was watching you on Dancing with the Stars. Okay. um, Because that was, like, my jam growing up. Uh Such a fun show. Can you kind of, like, take me through how you came to LA, like, what your kind of origin story is before we really, like, dig in? Totally. So I've danced my whole life since I was four years old. Um, It was the one thing my mom put me in that I never complained about. (laughs) from everything to volleyball, soccer, baseball, I mean, like everything. And I was like, you know what? Dancing is what I want to do. And I started ballet from four to 11. And then I um, grew out of my tights, literally my hips. I got my period when I was nine years old Mm. and I just didn't look like everybody. I basically look like what I do now when I was like nine, 10 and developed very young. And I just was like, I can't do this anymore. And then my parents, more my stepdad and my mom wanted to find a family sport to do together. Mm -hmm. Tennis was a no go. So we tried, or they first tried ballroom dancing, and they're like, Cheryl, you've got to start ballroom oh, dancing. And I'm like, that is not, I'm not doing this. You already forced me to go to Cotillion. I'm not going <laughs> to freaking waltz with an old man. And she's like, no, 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 there's kids your age. So I went to, um, I'm from the Bay Area. So I went to a dance competition, a local one, and I saw kids my age shaking their butts with a Love boy. That. And you're like, dancing, sign me up. <laughs> yep, dancing to other music other than classical piano music. And I was like, 
oh my God, this is amazing. And so, you know, I when I put my mind to something and I've always been this personality, I am an addict as well. So I go harder, I go home. Right. So that's pretty much it. And I just, from the moment I started cha cha I was like, oh my God, I love this. And then I took it to the next level. And so at 13, I traveled all over the world, basically just me and my partner. Um, I also lost my virginity when I was 13. To um, your partner? Yeah. Oh. Um, Wait, was he Latin? No. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll get into the Latin mind you, struggles we have later. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, for sure. And I think I blame the Latin dancing in ballroom, right? That whole category. Because right. you're just like, I don't know. Okay, we'll get there. Um, <laughs> but we were like training every summer. I would be in England just training my butt off and, you know, traveling the world. Ballroom is a worldwide sport. It isn't the cheapest of the sports. So my mom had to obviously work and help me support my dancing career, which I'm gr- very grateful for. Now, should have th- there been a chaperone? Probably. Right. But I grew up really fast and in the ballroom industry in general, like it's an os- like an Oscar party. Every time you're at a dance competition, everyone's dressing up, but it also isn't so glamorous. Mm. I've always wanted to do a show about you know, like dance moms, but for ballroom, like, cause it's a real thing. And, you know, to put all these like, like lashes on and tan and makeup at like 12, 13 and literally dry humping each other is probably not, I don't think I'd ever, if I ever have kids make them You're like steer them away from ballroom dancing. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting that you started in ballet. I did as well. And I remember, you know, ballet was like the main thing I was doing. And then we like kind of branched off into jazz. When I took my first hip hop class, I was like, fuck yes, I'm home. Like I had my little stank face on. I was like getting down. I was probably like one of the only white kids on my dance hip hop team in high school. And it was like where I felt at home. And I was like, fuck ballet. Because it was not weird for you to untrain your body. Because for me, you st- I mean, I am, I can't hip hop because I'm yeah. like, I feel so weird, yet I walk like I'm humped over sometimes. <laughs> I look like Ozzy Osbourne You're once like, in a while. I walk with a swag, but, but like, I can't dance When I'm with dancing, because like ballroom's all about exaggerating and like, yeah. you know, tits to the sky and like <laughs> everything is, and hip hop is so different. Yeah, it, for me, it like totally let me break out of the structure. I've yeah. always fought like having such a structure and ballet is so structured. Mm-hmm. And I, I always like pulled back from authority and right. ballet teachers are always so authoritative. Yes. And so when I got into hip hop, it was just like, oh fuck, this is fun. It's like freedom. Yeah, I wish I would have done ballroom when I was younger. Never I didn't, too late, girl, I never too in, late, never too late. I didn't get into my salsa days until uh, later in life, but. <laughs> That's where you're going to meet all those Latin men. Not like you need to. You're now married. I or know. Engaged. I know. And engaged, married. Engaged. And he's from the Bay as well. Oh, really? Where? Yeah. He grew up in Marin. Oh, okay. I'm from like Palo Alto by Stanford. Oh, nice. Right. Yeah. My first dance partner was from Marin. I remember him having to do the commute. I was 13. He was 18. Mm. Wait, stop. That's Whoops. who you lost your virginity to? Yeah. He was <gasps> 17. Oh, my God. Wait. Okay. Sorry, mom. Can we? Well, I and lost. Dad. I lost my virginity when I was fifteen and a half. It was okay. my freshman year of high school. Got your permit. And I was Fine. dating a senior, yeah. and he was eighteen. And my mom still, till this day, if I bring it, he was the nicest fucking guy. Your we, mom knows. Oh yeah. Oh, that's I'm great. Too that close with have. my mom. That's great. We lost our virginity to each other. Like okay. he was the nicest guy. We were together for like eight or nine months. She still, if someone brings up his name, will get like a death stare in her eye and be like, "He took advantage of you. He was eighteen. I mean, you were too." Young. literally illegal yeah right but like 18 and or 17 yeah. and 13 yeah. that's like i know yeah bring on the judgment no, so, no i'm, I'm not judging i want to know like no it was it because of ballroom like we spent yeah. so we had such a bond because he was my very first dance partner as an amateur and we traveled the world and i looked up to him like yeah from, i've always wanted to dance with him like when i was younger literally when we tried out I got a call that he wanted to like actually dance with me. And I remember I was about to jump in the shower. I think I danced around my house butt naked. (laughs) I was so happy. And like when you look up to somebody, when you're a super fan, you know, you can just take advantage of me. I mean, not anymore, but yeah. Right. Do you think now as an adult Maybe Brad Pitt could do it, but I don't know. Brad Pitt can do anything he wants to (laughs) me at any time. Sorry, Ty. Um, Do you think when you're an adult now looking back on that, are you like, ooh, that was like not so great of him to cross that line i on i think i broke his heart so like i'm the one that love that yeah (laughs) i definitely like by the way the sex wasn't like pleasure like i didn't find any pleasure in it It was painful so i think we did it like once or twice it wasn't like a constant thing but i also you know after my coach says this that like i guess i 
grew out of this partnership and it was time to move on and that's like really hard in the ballroom world because it's a it's a marriage you yeah. know you, you do everything together and it was time to move on if i wanted to get better results and so mm. yeah that was it and then he moved to oregon or something and, and i'm sure he's married by now i don't keep in touch with him yeah but. that's wild okay so i have a past with you know looking and not feeling comfortable in my body all the time um i've struggled with eating disorders in the past i do think that a lot of dancers can relate to that and i know you've been really open with your body dysmorphia yeah and your struggles with that so can you kind of tell me where you think that started was it when you grew out of your tights because my body uh, yeah. changed too i don't have a ballet dancer's body you have an amazing you're beautiful thank just you just the way you are I, yeah, as are you but uh, thank if you. you are in the dance world there's a ballerina body and there's not and it right. was like well i could be a hip-hop right. dancer i could be a contemporary dancer but like i didn't have a prima ballerina body right like, which, is, which is no hips and, like, yeah exactly you know like a coke bottle <laughs> <laughs> a beautiful coke bottle i love being a coke bottle we um, love our coke bottles i here. mean really though i do i believe most men prefer um a little bit of a curve right like yeah. i mean Yes, unfortunately. Although all bodies are beautiful. Yes, of course, <laughs> absolutely. I I do believe that, you know, you are your environment kind of. And when you feel like for me, I, I just remember developing at such a young age, like I said, but then also being one of the first people in my school to develop and then like seeing other people's bodies in tights versus me with already like a waist and also hips and a, and a butt and thighs. I was just like, that was probably one, like I'd say it's probably traumatic, right? Like going back there, it was yeah. like, oh my God, I'm just like, and I just didn't feel like I fit in. And then my mom always even when I was younger, like she was always on diets. She was like trying the new like Atkins at the time or like South Beach. And so there's always been this, I guess, watch what you eat type thing. And mm -hmm. coming from a Filipino background, like Filipino food is so good. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and it's so bad for you at the same time, right? So like I was raised by my Filipino nanny basically while my mom was starting her startup company in 84. And so like I only was fed Filipino food. So then trying these like new diets was mm -hmm. like really I, I don't know if that was appropriate at the age that i was what age I was, did like, that start probably 11 12 oh my 13. god yeah and it wasn't like she forced me to but it was just like what was being served right you know and then i started ballroom and my dance coach not right away but especially when i started getting older like probably 15 16 he was i was going to the next level as far as like competing worldwide. And he was like, you know, you have to keep that weight down, think thin. You know, he looked into elongating my legs. Mm -hmm. It sounds so bad, yeah. but like, I mean, he was like a mentor to me. And at the time I didn't know the difference. And so I always felt like I just wasn't enough, right? So there was this all this want, and mind you, it also came from when I got molested when I was a little girl. So it's like, there's always this need of like, okay, I want the love and I want all of the attention, but not in a healthy way. And it was more for, unfortunately, the, you know, material side of things, not necessarily, you know, from what was inside. Yeah. And um, because I got molested, I grew up very quiet and introverted, I think. Mm. I never really was asked my opinion, let alone I was very shy and reserved because I was too scared to speak my thoughts and or my opinion or my feelings, let alone. But my mom made sure she put me in therapy when I was a little girl. But until I really moved here to Los Angeles in 2006, was I able to really find my own identity. Mm. It was interesting to see like my very first audition versus what it is now. But back to the whole body dysmorphia, it's a real thing for me and then he put me on the hollywood diet back to my dance coach put me on the hollywood diet which is just like a juice like a bottle of juice right. and i remember i lost so much weight and not until i lost weight was i did i feel like i fit in like i mm. didn't feel like i was loved by my dance coach until that happened and then which is so fucking toxic it really and is. like not yeah. to mention that it's not that it's healthy even if you're just like hanging out around the house but like you're an athlete and you're mm -hmm. physically like being demanded of daily and you're not having the calories and the nutrients that you need to like 
perform and do the job that you're trying to we do. We don't even think about that. Like that is just not like putting our health first or listening to our body. That's just non-existent. We were never taught. It's like, oh, you broke your ankle. You got another one, you know, because it's like. Yeah, tape the, it up and get back on stage. <laughs> right. And and the, I'm sure you know that. Yeah. And it's like as a dancer, it's like if you don't continue the momentum, you have to start all over again. And right. no one wants to do that. And then moving here to L.A., I was a party girl. Like I never drank before I moved to Los Angeles, but it was like the show became a huge hit. We had like 35 million viewers, especially season two and three. And we would just get into like nightclubs. And I was like, a nightclub? What's a nightclub? Because like, I lived a very strict lifestyle before moving here. And then like I had my first drink and then I went out seven nights a week. And right. it was like, you know, ballroom by day, club goer by night. And it was like this constant seven nights a week thing. So I also, as you do when you're in your twenties, you know, I gained a few pounds. I also, I believe it's because I got off my birth control. Um, I tried to get off my birth control during like the premiere of one season, which ended up me, um, I guess, retaining 15 pounds of water weight mm. um, on camera in front of everybody. Right. And so then the nation decided to call me fat. It was a really big deal. Ugh, and I, I remember that, like vividly yeah. remember that. Yeah. And my mom, obviously, I think this was her way of showing love, but she um, she did the best she could. Look, she flew over here. She put me on the South Beach diet. And I'm just like, you know, that is something that is still a sore wound for me. It's yeah. like, as long as I'm shaking my ass on television in a costume like this, I think I will not be able to make peace with my body until I hang up my dance shoes. Right. And unfortunately, you know, like you look at the women that are on that show and mm -hmm. it's like everyone has very specific thin dancer bodies. Very. Like that's and a they've type. just had babies. Even. Right. Yeah. I know. And you're like, so how did you even bounce back that right. quick? And it's it's a lot when you're doing that. Not only are you feeling like the pressure inside yourself, but like you're America's watching you. Yep. The world's watching you and judging yep. you on that. And I feel so bad for the wardrobe department. I mean, they've known me. They know my body more than I do but like they know my insecurities they know that you know if something if there's elastic in one of my dresses that it's too tight like i will literally it'll dictate the rest of my day as far as my mood yeah. goes and it is hard because yes if i understand that comparing isn't a good thing how can you not right you know how can you not like it's just really, and, it's, and of course, like I'm here in these fittings, like it's not just about the way the dress looks on me standing. It's like, how about when I'm moving my hips and it's like, do I see a back? It's just like, it's exhausting. Yeah. It's exhausting. And I think a lot of that has to, I think that me wanting to maybe not do it anymore has a lot to do with that. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with the show itself. The show is obviously amazing and it's changed my life. It's about my own mental health. Right. So we, we've talked a lot about on this show about like eating disorders and feeling insecure in your own skin because I'm no fucking stranger to that. Mm -hmm. But we've never really covered body dysmorphia. Mm -hmm. Like what's your definition of that? So when I look in the mirror, I don't see what everybody sees. Right. I, no matter what. And I remember, you know, on my TikTok account, I, I literally um, feed, I just react to like, old dances and I remember mm -hmm. recently thinking like oh my god I remember this this was the fitting where I went crazy like mm. thinking that I was so fat but then I look at it and I was like so skinny right and it's interesting because when you're in the moment like when I see myself there's I'll focus on this one mm -hmm. thing that nobody sees right and it will dictate my life. Yeah. It will dictate my whole day if I don't feel secure. And some, and as dancers, we have mirrors all around us constantly. Mm -hmm. Like no matter what, you're gonna see yourself. Yeah, mirrors and cameras that yeah. like add ten pounds. When and you're so on does them. TV. TV yeah. adds ten pounds. Yeah. I don't think people really understood when I, you know, started talking about that I was having like a small percentage of readers like tell me that I was fat phobic in What's Eat Pray that? FML. It's basically so I've done research, I've talked to a lot of different uh -huh, people uh -huh. because the first time I heard it, I was like, What? Like I don't hate fat people. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I, no, that's not who I am at all. I love like everybody, but it's the fear of being fat and thinking that fat is a negative thing. So it wasn't the fact that I was like harping on myself and like saying like that, oh, I don't want to be fat or I'm like gaining 10 pounds on this trip. It was like the use of the word fat Got saying like it. that that's a bad thing. Right. No, and that's not also what I mean. I think it's more about like 
it's really difficult to explain, but it's like when people are just calling you that and even your colleagues, right. you know, like, right. and then also from your whole life, like whether that be being on a diet or being around people who dieted or my, my dance coach. So for me, I actually love curvy and voluptuous. I wouldn't say fat, voluptuous women. Like I think that is a beautiful thing, especially when you own it. And I hope one day to be able to do that. Cause I think naturally my body is my body. Like my right. hips are never gonna be more narrow. And that though, these are my hip bones. Like, yeah. you know, I'm never gonna look like those skinny ball ballerinas who also look beautiful. Right. But like, it's just that I always wanting something that isn't realistic. Yeah. And that's what to me, I guess, body dysmorphia is. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's interesting because you, in your perspective like there were literally people and colleagues telling you like that you had to lose weight or Full that you were on. fat or like I wasn't I was too fat for television right which is yeah. fucking horrific for me it was being growing up in an industry where it was like well we're not going to tell you that but like there's 10 other girls that are auditioning for this role and they all are you know this That's size so bad so I don't think when people heard me That's, harping that on is myself just as bad yeah yeah that it was like it was coming from a place of like deep insecurity. Yes. And yeah. you know, like my body it has nothing to do with anybody else. Right. Right. My and my body's always changed. Like I, you know, fluctuate all the mm -hmm, time. Same. And to be how I feel comfortable, I have to be in the gym five to six days a week and like really having a good balanced, like watching what I'm eating diet. Say I'm right now I'm like on a nine hundred calorie a day diet right now. Cheryl, that's insane. No, I know. <laughs> but like I'm doing this because of my body dysmorphia, right? Right, and, But I'm also doing this because I'm getting ready to do something yeah. soon. So it's like, I feel the, like, and I, and I don't weigh myself because I used to travel with a scale. Oh, I don't either. So I, I refuse. I, I mean, I would put it in my suitcase. I yeah. went, I did the Camino de Santiago and I traveled with a scale. Wow. And I would weigh in every morning and that number would affect everything. Yeah. Whether it'd be like, oh great, I lost a pound or if I gained half a pound, God forbid. Which sometimes it's fucking water weight or like you haven't taken a shit yet. Thank like, you. Yes. It, it's, I, yes. I refuse to ever weigh myself right. because it's like, I just go by what my, how my clothes fit. Because Same. if I'm training and I like gain a pound of muscle, like the yes. mental game that that will fuck with you. Yeah. If you're like, I've been working my ass off and I gain two pounds. Yeah. But like, it's muscle and you've no, like lost totally. in other places. So have you ever been able to look in the mirror and be like, damn, I feel really good or I like what I see? I'm tr right now that's my work in therapy. Mm. But see, the thing is I can easily bullshit myself too because I can say it all day. I can look at myself and say, right. I love you. And I, and I know that my love for me is actually definitely I'm on the right track with that just because of, you know, the latest whatever happened with whatever the divorce. But at the end of the day, you know, I don't know if I will ever just have peace with like, you know what, you're beautiful. I mean, like mm. no, no, no matter what size, right? Until again, I'm out of a dance costume. Do you think it'll get better once you're out of a dance costume? It has to, yes. I mean, this is the biggest reason why I won't freeze my eggs right now because I'm willing to sacrifice my whole life because I don't want to gain weight. Right. Like, because I mean, you're a smart, beautiful, intelligent woman. Like, you know, mm -hmm. 900 calories is not enough to sustain yourself. Uh, not for a With long time, but I, I know, but I do want it, <laughs> obviously. Yes. And I do want, but that's how much I want to lose a few pounds. Right. Again, I don't weigh myself, but it has worked. And I also know though that my metabolism has slowed down quite a lot yeah. since just a few years ago. So look, if this is what's going to keep me sane, obviously this is nothing to be proud of as well. Like I'm doing this because I need instant results basically, but it's not something to survive on right. when I start the project. Right. How old were you when you started Dancing with the Stars? 21. I'm 38. That's crazy. If I do another season, it'll be my 26th or 27th season. That's crazy. Yeah. Because I remember, like, I watched this in high school, and I felt like when I was watching it, I was like, oh, my God, these, like, with my adult short professional dancers. And, like, you were a fucking baby. Like, I was a baby. You were a child. I had, I had a belly button ring. I remember. I'll never forget that. Gross. But, <sighs> like, gross for me. But um, it was just, like, so insane like i thought i was gonna come here and do one season and then move back to harlem with my dominican boyfriend slash partner yeah let's jump into that since that segued real nicely um you and i both have a problem it's not it's I've not your addiction many past. problems <laughs> it's um it's but our latin lovers anonymous problem i think it's the dancer in us is it is I, that what it I is? I mean, when did you start like Latin men? Like when you started salsa dancing? No, no. Always. So I, my, the first guy I lost my virginity to, the 18 year old, was Salvadorian. 
The guy I dated after was Mexican. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's I dated been a two Salvadorians problem. and one Dominican. No, for sure. And I'm just like, honestly, I don't even know how I ended up marrying a white man. Oh my man. God, me too. It's like, I call it my white boy coma. I know. Like we just like slipped and fell into like the boring white men pool. Like, I don't know what happened. But Sorry, honestly, I, I love all, <laughs> all men. <laughs> I'm always scared that I'm going to like a fucking offend someone. White? No. Well, no, he's Persian and Irish. Oh. Yeah. There you go. But he doesn't look Persian. He looks like Italian or like Greek. Yeah, he doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't look like white, white. Right, right, yeah. right. He's like tannish. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's a, it's a big problem. And also I didn't know when I, you know, especially when I started dating Javier that there was a not that all latin men are like this yes exactly but there, there's a reputation there yes i mean even his friends like who are also argentinian were like yeah we're like the worst dude Girl. like why would you have thought that this was gonna and i'm like nobody fucking warned me i spent three and a half months in argentina i can't tell you i learned i just wanted i was going through a phase of my life where i was like i'm so tired of just teaching i need to like feed my brain yeah. and my soul and they added argentine tango to dancing with stars and i was like i really don't want to keep faking this so I joined the uh, tango group called Forever Tango. And my mom used to take me to this show like in the Bay Area when I was a little girl. And uh -huh. I fell in love. We didn't even speak the same language. Like they spoke Spanish. I was a part of the whole Forever Tango group. And I fell in love with like three, four people. I would never come home. I, I just, I always say I would go back and just live there. It was, yeah, I can't and imagine. And especially if you can smell cologne. I love cologne. So like, yeah. Okay, so you fell in love, but were you like hooking up with I any of the fell hot in love. I was in lust. Of course I did. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so you were having like hot, passionate yes, sex all yes. over Argentina. Mind you, I was also drinking back then, but yes. Right. Oh my God. It's a lot God. easier for me to do that. My my fiance god bless his soul is like you can go solo travel anywhere in this world that you want i will support you i will champion you if you go to south america i am coming with you <laughs> like yep. that's the line 100%. Like, you're not you're going smart. there by yourself <laughs> very smart man i'm like you know that's fair okay I get yeah it. <laughs> no there's something you know what it is i think it's they're so in touch with body language mm -hmm. and they're so they can touch like i'm very sensitive to touch yeah so like versus like a, a handshake even like they're they're making love to your hands Rep. <laughs> Shake my hand. I'm or, gonna fuck your and, hand. Yeah, literally. <laughs> like and there and like you just when you don't have it. Like even when I'm a when I'm dancing in it. If like the other professional I'm dancing with when we used to do pro numbers isn't sensitive to like the woman and is just about himself. It's just like the worst thing in the world. Like because ballroom is so old school. Like right. the man leads, the woman follows, and I think that's a beautiful thing. In but we all know who really fo leads, right? Like yeah. we're the ones doing it. But like when a man takes care of you when like let's say he dips you and you like do something on the floor as part of the choreography when he reaches his hand out and picks you up it's very like opening the door is very important for me still right, like, right. all of that stuff that people don't necessarily do anymore mm -hmm. because of the just you know the way that <laughs> this world is and also the new generation i don't yeah. think people are learning good manners right and i just like to be taken care of yeah is it different when you dance like with a professional like white guy pro as opposed to like a latin guy is uh, there like a different like you know what's so funny we don't there? have one latin guy on our show really no like a lot of them are ukrainian or russian oh right yeah who's okay so like val he's he, very, whenever very, i watch yeah, him he's, he's great. very intense yes, and like looks like he's like gonna have sex with anything yep. that like crosses his val, path and, but so i'm part of the older generation i'm still on the show maybe on the show but um <laughs> the older generation so val's older brother max he was yeah. all both of them though the brothers they both schmerkowski brothers they're ge a gentleman 100 percent. yeah but is it different dancing with one of them than say like Derek? <laughs> no comment oh god <laughs> i have a soft how spot how did you know no. i have a soft spot for Derek. what, well, what made you the, what made you think that you know it's just i, I, I mean like the, the white TV. white boy yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. do you see that though i'm just interested do you see that what when, when he was active as a professional dancer did you see the way he maybe his body language was to his partner versus someone like max or val mm. A, a little I mean he's an incredible dancer like oh, 100%. I 100% and choreographer like 100%. he's ridiculous but I guess like the answer to that would be like, like I Derek wanted need a to like <laughs> yeah. when I was single wanted to jump through and fuck Val and not Derek <laughs> so that's where the uh, inference of the question came from this is why I love you oh my you. god I hope you guys never listen to this oh show oh my god fuck. people are gonna f die when they hear this <laughs> so where did your like Derek's like a brother well, yeah. You guys actually look 
like you guys come from the same oh my god family. that's so kind of you because i think julianne's gorgeous yeah, she's so i appreciate beautiful. that actually a couple people when whenever we post stuff that's like who would play gabrielle in the series Julianne, if that ever goes yeah. people people have tagged her before i think she's lovely you guys are always asking me what other podcasts can i listen to other than fml talk every wednesday you are in luck i have an incredible recommendation for you Ilana Dunn hosts the podcast Seeing Other People, a no bullshit, no rules dating podcast where Ilana and her guests help you feel less alone and more empowered in your dating life, which I know some of y'all are needing right now. On Tuesdays, she's joined by relationship coaches, mental health professionals, and other like-minded individuals to discuss all the crazy nuances of modern dating while providing expert advice. On Thursdays, unfiltered episodes, she has anonymous listeners join the show to share their challenges and how they've overcome them, like getting an STD, recovering from an eating disorder, being cheated on, you know, all the crazy things life throws at us. This podcast is filled with FML stories, advice, and support in the wild world of dating. Check out Seeing Other People with Ilana Dunn, Tuesdays and Thursdays, wherever you get your podcasts. So... Was the first toxic Latin guy you dated the Dominican? No, the Salvadorian. <laughs> Where, when was that? This was like freshman. So I dated two Salvadorians throughout my high school career. Okay. Yeah. So one already had a baby mama drama. In high school? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, he was older than me. So he was a junior. I was a and freshman. And you were like, all right, I'll take that baby mama. Yep. And, and I remember one. like, <laughs> I remember he worked at Felix and like... <laughs> the rent a suit place yeah yes, tuxedo and um i walk in like he had this mark on his neck and i was like what is that he goes oh you know my ex just threw this rock at my neck and i was like Mar, you think i'm you think i'm stupid oh right? my god clearly she gave him a hickey right um so that was that and then i just let that abuse type thing happen as far as like letting him cheat on me and not doing anything about it mm. then i moved on to the other salvadorian and um god he was just as bad if not worse he was actually physical. i feel so bad it's like we're like it was like physical and mental this one so mm. that one was like toxic because that went yeah. on and on for like three four years yeah was that the first time you were in a physically abusive relationship yes how did you handle that mm. so young well you know he was very controlling so like i wasn't able to dance so there was a moment in time where i stopped dancing or mm. i would lie to him about it and then as soon as i graduated from high school it was like in and out like this is when i was like at my skinniest most likely was when i would be breaking up with him every other week and it right. was like i just lost my appetite and i just remember my dancing career i had my gay dance partner at the time flew in from finland and we just like he gave me that kind of i guess at that time i wasn't really in therapy at that moment but he gave me that like confidence yeah like i deserve better you know and so i was able to unfortunately and fortunately like be like enough's enough but then he started like stalking me a little bit and then mm. i would and then i started trying out with this dominican this was already after high school and like I, all of a sudden he's in new york you know because we lived in harlem at the time mm -hmm. and like he would just show up oh creepy and then i just had to like just be done and yeah i don't really remember to be quite honest how it officially ended but i think that was enough to scare him maybe that I was with somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so explain to me how you slipped into your white boy coma and ended up marrying a white guy after all of the um, I, there's hot just, Latin men that have been in your life. You know, I, there's just not a lot of Latin men in general around me at the yeah. moment. I think that, listen, I danced with William Levy on Dancing with the Stars. Mm -hmm. um, he was, I think he's married. Christian De La Fuente, all these amazing telenovela actors that are just so beautiful. Yeah. And it helped that they were married, obviously. Right. Um, but yeah, there is an attraction there. And I guess I'm not really, when it comes to Dancing with the Stars, because that was my life, like 24 seven, there's not really a lot of Latin men. Like, I don't think I can tell you one Latin guy right now that I'm friendly with. Yeah. To this day. I have a few, and the main one is my ex's best friend. So oh, is he single? <laughs> Maybe you need to hook a girl up. Just he's kidding. not. He just got married, and oh, he's such okay. a sweetheart. Um, Love you, dude. Um, I think subconsciously, I relate to Latin men as trouble, and maybe I'm... Maybe that's why I ended up marrying a white man. Oh, yeah. There was a thought onion that I vividly remember I doing thought onions. <laughs> in Barcelona being like, Javier ruined Latin men for me because now I'm like not safe Oof, to like, go there. I felt all your pain through that whole chapter, like that whole part in your book because I was like, 
of course, of course. How could you not like right. just fall head over heels? Yeah. And he did all the right things. Yeah. I did. And he never cheated. Who? Javier? Javier? No, we weren't together long enough. Right. Although, but girl, he never left you because of. Girl, the shit I have found oh, out. I cannot post wait. books. Like. Oh, I just want to tell oh, you off please. podcast. Please. I also need to know what his real name is. It's. A, <laughs> um, I will tell you off podcast. It is. It is. Are a, you shocked? A whole nother book. Um. Am I? I don't. I mean, I. I mean, uh, no. Yeah. You know, like I, if I would have found out in the time where I held him in such a high esteem and was still protecting him and thinking that he was this person that I knew so well. Yes. Not finding out, knowing, you know, who. Yeah. I feel he is now. Yeah. No. So and you, that's so you guys sad are for me to even say out loud. No. Okay. No. Got it. But you haven't read the second book yet, so no. you'll see oh, how yeah, some, of it, that. Yes, some yes. of it winds up. But, there, you know, the list goes on. Got it. I could write a third, but we uh, won't. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, Not my yet. God. My DMs are going to be like, wait, wait, stop. Yes, Gabrielle. Okay. So, so can we, I know that you're going through. A divorce. A divorce right yes. now. Are we allowed to talk about who you're divorcing? Mm. Probably not. I mean, people can, can you Google can it. Easily Google it if um, you don't know. I mean, it's been everywhere. So, yeah, people yeah. can Google it, but it's crazy to me because, like, it's someone that I grew up watching. I think we all did and yeah. loving. Yeah. How do you feel that? How How old were you when the divorce became like? You were like, okay, we're getting divorced. Right. So I, this. So we are in August right now. Right. So um, as we're recording, as this. we're recording <laughs> this. So. I was 38. I mean, I'm is January was when yeah. we split up. We're not even technically divorced yet, so we're okay. still going through the whole back and forth thing, um, which is taking longer than I ever expected, especially with a prenup in place. But right. um, you know, just for your listeners, there's there is a confidentiality agreement within this prenup, so this is the reason why I have to kind of walk on eggshells. But yeah. I can tell you as much as I can tell you. you know? Yeah. And how how do you feel? being like, okay, I'm 38 and I'm joining the divorce club. Because when I joined it, I was 27 Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I was like, cool, like I'm 27, I'm moving back to my mom's house and I'm getting divorced. So how do you feel um, doing that, I guess, a decade pretty much later? Yeah. You know, I come from a divorced family. I never, this was never the goal and it's not like something that I'm taking lightly. We definitely tried, you know, and there comes a point too where, you know, I have to choose myself Yeah. Um, because of all like the therapy I'm in currently and even before and even like um, just the work and the curiosity and how much I, I my, my goal is to just constantly learn and educate myself and to be better. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, you know, my ex didn't want that. He we were just on two different paths. And unfortunately, you know, it became like a roommate living in my home. Yeah. And when it gets there, it's almost like you've broken a boundary and you've crossed the line and it's really hard to come back. Yeah. Regardless, I mean, we we were very consistent with couples therapy and, you know, a lot of what was said, it's like there, it's just really hard for me to have a conversation, let's say with somebody who I think is one way. And then like the accountability part is really hard. And for both of us, I think at that time too, like I, it was hard for me to take accountability over my shit, but I do know that moving forward, this is definitely one of my, like, that has to happen with my friendships, with my relationships, with my, you know, partners in the future, with anybody that I choose to surround myself with that is very important to me yeah it's one of my top three for sure yeah absolutely how how do you feel that the divorce has left you as far as like shame and feeling like guilt around it or are you kind of like okay i'm gonna move forward from this and like it's gonna be a new beginning for me Mm because i dealt with a lot of shame and like fear of judgment at first and now looking back on it i'm like I had nothing to be ashamed about. Like, no. I was choosing me. I was getting out of a toxic situation. Girl, you like, have nothing to be yeah. ashamed about. Yeah, yeah. with uh, everything that, you know, you have nicely have shared with the whole <laughs> world. Because, you know, reading your story definitely helped me so much. Just oh, know so that I'm in the, on the right track. So with my divorce, it became national news, right? So it's like, it was a big deal. I had paparazzi uh, hiding in bushes outside my home. It was constantly followed for a solid six weeks. I was 
hiding in my house and then I had to have my housekeeper pretend like she was me and then I had to like leave and I just got the hell out of here and I went to San Diego and I just like so when that is happening I get clouded I guess and my therapist said this as well you get clouded by the um, adrenaline from it mm -hmm. like a little bit and so but then it all of a sudden hit me probably like a month later but mind you during our marriage was when it really stung because I knew at a certain point that there was really no hope yeah unfortunately and that was my lowest of the low was, yeah was feeling so alone mm. during you know the pandemic and then during um even when I did Dancing with the Stars it was like we still did it during the pandemic, but then, you know, there was no audience, but then I was like, right. I just didn't feel like we could have conversations like we used to anymore. And it was, when it comes to shame, I, there's moments still to this day that I go in and out. Like sometimes I wake up and I'm like, I'm the most vulnerable when I wake up. And sometimes I'm like, I just can't believe that I'm divorced. Like, mm -hmm. I just can't believe it. And then there's moments of like, I feel like I'm definitely on the right track yeah. because I chose me. And yeah. I don't think that I could have done that even just a year ago. Yeah. There is a moment I feel where it does shift from just being like, okay around it to mm -hmm. like weirdly empowered by it. Yeah. And that does come. And, and that I, doesn't mean that he's in the wrong, right? Like right. there is moments where like, for sure, look, all we can do is point the finger at ourselves, right? Like yeah. there's nothing that, I mean, yes, maybe blaming that other person is gonna make me feel this, no, but I feel empowered because no matter what the situation was, it always stems from something. Like whatever happened, that was icing on the cake, yeah. right? But it's like the red flags for the both of us. Like we just didn't probably listen. Yeah, pay attention. Yeah. We're just like, let's go to the carnival. I think I just wanted to know. <laughs> I think I just, I mean, like, again, I planned a, a big wedding, you know, Mindy Weiss was our wedding planner. And it was like, I, that was not even what? Like, no, I couldn't do that. Right. You know, and it was like the high of that. Yeah. Do you feel like with the, the confidentiality in place, so like you can't talk freely about it, do you feel that that's frustrating for you? Like, would you want to be sharing your story as a form of therapy? Or are you kind of like, no, it's private, let it stay private? I don't mind it. I think that I've shared enough to where, um, you know, look, there's always two sides to every story, right. not necessarily my story. You know, there's also his side to the story. And I think it's best private at this yeah. point. I don't think I am, I'm not in need. Like, yes, I'm very honest and I'm an open book, but there, there is that part of it that I actually would like to keep private yeah and i talk about it quite a lot when i'm off camera yeah you know yeah and that's like that's enough. my therapy yeah i mean i am in therapy when i talk about yeah, it yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um so i want to kind of dive in to your recovery with substance abuse what what Alcohol. was your yeah. yeah that was your poison yeah. yeah and like can you kind of give a little bit of insight as to what when it became a problem and like how bad it was it became a problem. So even though it's not hereditary, my real dad was an alcoholic and he passed away when, um, that was what, right when I got engaged. And um, I became, I guess, that person as well. When drinking vodka sodas every day was like water and nothing affected me. Mm. Because I have social phobia and I've been diagnosed by my ther a certified therapist, obviously. Wait, I'm sorry. Can you explain what that is? I am scared of being in big crowds. Like I actually have panic attacks. So like, I know you're like, oh, how do you dance and shake your ass in front of millions well, of people? Well, no, but like, how are you telling saying Gabrielle, let's go salsa dancing if you like are scared to be there, in there like- There is a part of it. Wow. Yeah, which is why I need to go with a group of people that I know. Oh, got it. Yeah. And so that's like a real- It's a real issue. Wow. Especially with no alcohol. Yeah. So the alcohol helped. So Cope mind you, it. here yeah. I remember when I said when I was like, before I moved to Los Angeles, I was this very quiet and introverted person. So the attention, like I never signed up on this show to be famous. That was never my goal. I was going to be a starving dancer with my Dominican partner, right. regardless of if he cheated on me or not. It didn't matter. Like I would have just stayed there in, uh, and as a starving dancer and just try and be the world champion, whatever. And it's not necessarily, you don't get a lot in return so much when it comes to money and all of that. It was just the passion. Yeah. And then I come here and then producers are asking me for my opinion and I actually could barely say a sentence. Wow. I thought I had to drink. So I had to like have glasses of wine and um, like even before performing before an interview girl before like wow. a, a, say I had a 7 a.m. master interview. I'd oh. be drinking. Oh, my God. 24 seven. And then like when we would go out after the show, the producers would be like, 
well, see, this is what we need. We need that fun Cheryl. So like I got praised for. Right. You're like, do you want me to get sloshed before And they dancing? said yes. Yeah. Basically they said yes. I mean, they didn't feed me alcohol, obviously. Right. But like they, you know, they knew I was this party girl. I was on TMZ every morning. Wow. For the longest time. It's still hard for me to shake off that reputation. Yeah. But like every morning, you know, my friends would be like, here you go again. It was like, I was called Dancing with the Bars, which is my next <gasps> book. I have to write. Oh my God, this. you do, have to, with the bars. You I do know. have to write that. <laughs> um, Coming soon. No, I'm kidding. No, there's no book deal yet in place, but <laughs> hopefully. But hit her up. Yeah. Um, wait, so would you drink before you would perform? That is something I didn't need to do. Okay. And I, because that would be, is, I mean, like, if I have like two glasses of wine or like a shot of tequila and then try and go salsa dance, I'm like 10 times more out of breath than I would have been. Totally. Without. With stamina. Yeah. But yeah. mind you, we're also not dancing to that. I'm dancing with celebs with no right dance ability right most of the time yeah but i would drink basically so seven nights a week okay so like this is like me out of jail get out of jail free card i am able like and my first two my two first seasons on the show the second third season was my most successful i won both seasons and i you know, was being followed. This was the whole Nick Lachey and Jessica Simpson split up Mm because I danced with Drew Lachey. Yeah. I was in the middle of it. How so? Because I was dancing with Drew and then people thought, I think I was hooking up with Nick. What? Yeah. So because Nick would come watch. together? Well, because he would watch his brother and support us. Right. And then we would all go out at night. Oh, got it. So I was like the only person in that car. Right. And when I tell you, I was still like this mousy, shy little girl, yeah. but like a fiery cracker, like firecracker on the dance floor. And yeah. dance was always like my, I would say, alter ego. It was like, this is why I say dance to save my life. Because whenever I'm performing, it's a different me. Yeah. But still me. Yeah, I get that. But it's hard to explain. It's like the movement and um, the execution of my movement comes from an authentic emotion in my body mm-hmm. that sometimes I can't put into words yeah right unless if I drink alcohol or right. so I thought yeah and so I that, have that too she's called Lolita <laughs> I, love, I love Lolita I love she, it she only comes out in very very dire situations <laughs> yeah and I and for me it's like that vision of my little black bob that my dance coach cut my hair like totally chopped my hair was down to my ass anyway and then I, he was like for one of the bigger competitions in blackpool england he was like we need to give you a fresh new look and then that's why so i was known when i first moved here as that girl with the bob yeah. you know and um oh my god that tan i mean i was fresh <laughs> off the competition floor with like i looked l- crazy anyway so I had straight success from the moment I moved here. I went out every single night and I also was only 21. I had the stamina of a 21 year old. I would walk into rehearsal the next morning and my partners would guess the alcohol that I drank for years. And because I thought that I was, I thought that the only way I can be living a life like this, being constantly followed around and pop, I mean, it was crazy going coming from like nothing in that sense to like not being asked my opinion i had an english accent like i had no identity yeah you know and then all of a sudden people wanting and caring about like me just me without my dance partner it's crazy yeah it's a big like life overwhelming if i would have been followed around with like cameras and paparazzi when i was 21 it would have been a fucking shit show yeah like thank god i I mean not under scrutiny during that time in my life that was a big moment with jennifer with jennifer with um nick and jessica like that was like right at their split yeah right so it was like i i was exposed to stuff and i saw stuff that was just too overwhelming let alone here i am dancing in front of millions of people yeah so when did you realize that it was like a problem um it was a problem when mm, like that real like come to jesus moment was when mm, my ex and i got back together again because like so we dated 10 years prior married yeah so we met through his older brother season three of dancing with the stars oh my god dated for oh my god i'm like putting together all the dots behind the scenes this is great okay yeah (laughs) we dated for a year I met him through his brother who was dancing with one of the dancers on Dancing with the Stars. And then we went on tour. So we used to go on tour after the show. And that's where I met my ex. And then we dated for a year. And I was like, just so new to this whole thing. And I was like, 
hmm, I don't think I'm ready for this like relationship yeah. or whatever. And then we didn't even run into each other at a Ralph's 10 years later. You know, my sister goes, whatever happened to so-and-so? Mm. And she's like, I really liked him. So she took my phone, texted him, said, <gasps> let's have dinner. Oh and then he was, I was like, for sure he's married, right? Like yeah. for sure, there's no way he's not. He wasn't basically had dinner like New Year's Eve of 2015. Oh, that's like a big commitment, New Year's Eve dinner. <laughs> I know, or maybe it was going, heading into New Year's Eve. Right. So I remember the restaurant setting up. So it was probably the 29th, yeah, of January, um, 2015. And then we basically, yeah, that was, it was a quick one. It was like, we were together for maybe, maybe a year and a half. My dad died during that time. So we had that bond. Yeah. But so you were still drinking during this time? Yes. And then I remember my, uh, when my dad died, I said, I, ta- I didn't say anything to my ex. I just said like, wow, I could either like fall down this rabbit hole and check myself into the nearest rehab or I'll quit. And I tried to have a drink when I got home from Thailand where my dad was living and mm-hmm. where his wake was. And then I come back and I just bust out into hives. So it was for vanity reasons, Mm. really, why I stopped. Like hives, Gabrielle, it was bad. Like I never had this type of reaction. I tried every single type of alcohol and I would just bust out into hives. Wait, My body what? was like full on rejecting the so poison. So you're like, you go from I being, go from like being a, a decade raging alcoholic. Drinking. Yeah, like nothing. I stopped getting drunk. Like there was not, I would, what? there was just nothing. I could drink like a whole Tito's, a uh, bottle of Tito's literally and just pee a lot. Like as if I just drank a gallon of water. And all of a sudden you just started like having like a yes. fucking weird reaction. Yeah that's weird that was the universe being like unless it's for this yeah yeah Yeah. oh my god so how long have you been sober now four years um this past july wow congratulations thank you and what do you feel has changed with making that commitment my whole life my whole uh, i guess my head is clear and too clear now i i do know the reason why i used to drink because my brain doesn't shut off at oh, all. I feel like, you on that one, dude. <laughs> whoa. And I, and I always, it's so hard because, you know, I'm active in the 12 step program and it's hard because like a lot of people relate to their experience with like hitting rock bottom. Mm-hmm. I was the most successful when I was drinking. Right. And I, for me though, know that there are moment, tons of moments when I was drinking where I didn't feel present. I wasn't there. I let alone remember like, you know, those times where we would go out and go on tour and those moments you want to remember, I just don't. Mm. And I think because I, since I stopped, everything's changed, including my relationship. Right. Yeah. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just my my head is just clearer. And like, I see everything to the point where I'm just like, God, did I have to see that? I didn't really didn't want to see that. And if I'm like, if I would have just been in that alcoholic phase of my life, I probably wouldn't have. But in a way, I just have to be grateful because I finally, I feel like have another chance at life. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that coinciding with like the divorce and like yeah. you're really like going through this weird rebirth that's going to be really beautiful and in the he long was run. a part of like the uh, height of it yeah right like from a decade prior to yeah. also stopping like i just like it was yeah it's sometimes insanity. like sometimes those people you know I, I don't know if you believe in soul contracts like before we even get here but i feel like a lot of my toxic exes like we had soul contracts and they came into my life for a very specific reason to like uproot some shit. Cause I met Javier six years before he and I, you know, reconnected and went to that club and like started our whole thing. Wait, so why did you guys hook up the first Um, Oh my God, she's gonna kill me. So, (laughs) sorry mom. Um, So we went to- Does your mom listen to every episode? No, no, Um, but you know, I'm putting her on blast and she'll probably get DMs about it, but it's fine. Um, So I went to a rap party with her and they had been on the same show. So he was there and it was at this like little club and he was like, of course, dancing and she like throws me into the dance floor oh and she's my like, God, your mom come did dance this. with she's my kidding. daughter. And like we start dancing and like, you know, that's where the downfall of our fucking existence is. It's anytime that we're on the dance floor together. Oh, no. um, and he ended up getting my number that night and was like, let's like, you know, go dancing. And we we went out 
twice casually went to like and nothing happened oh no i mean we made out and like we danced a lot but and like he tried to take me home and i said no and that was the extent of it like dry humping on the dance floor and you know it's where all my fucking problems start yeah that's great um okay so if you can tell people that are listening who have gone through some of the i feel like we've covered so much shit in this episode like body dysmorphia so much addiction more too, but yeah latin lovers yeah, anonymous right? um if you can tell people that are listening kind of like what you've learned and what your big takeaway is from some of the struggles that you've gone through yeah what would that be or that, a few, if there's yeah, I mean, multiple. There's, you're how like, long do you you're got? like you literally just like uh, named every struggle in my life, Gabrielle. You know, <laughs> no, it's I actually have more, believe it or not. Um, but you know, failure isn't failure. Failure is success because without the failure, in quotes, like it's not a bad thing, right? I think like in society today, if the thought of failure, the thought of defeat, just makes people want to just not even try, mm. and it really. Without it, how do you succeed? Yeah, and how do you celebrate the wins? No, but how? Like, I am so used to rejection, and God damn it, it sucks. Like, I'm not even going to deny it. And I've just been so lucky to be a part of a show for God knows 65 seasons now. (laughs) Not really, but like a lot. And um, I just remember an occasional like audition and just getting turned down. And it's like, or maybe not winning that mirror ball trophy since season three, my mirror balls, like the fucking mirrors are like falling off and it's like so ghetto (laughs) but like at the end of the day you know it also isn't really about winning it's about the experience and the journey i have to tell you that i have learned so much through my journey or this chapter this very long chapter of me being on the show and through maybe moments of not necessarily loving my partner to creating such amazing relationships like there is always a takeaway Mm -hmm. Even this divorce, there's always a takeaway, whether that be, and I think that's what our purpose is. It's like our purpose, and I think in general, but I can speak for myself in life, is to just continue to learn and feed your soul. Mm -hmm. And whatever that is, you know, it isn't a purpose I think people get confused with isn't just like, oh, I'm going to be president of the United States or my purpose is to help like something so specific. Your purpose is to do you and to then show by action instead of just preach it, you know? And I think that is really, um, and I know that maybe that's anticlimactic to a lot of people. No, I think that's so beautiful and so important because without the failure, like we're not learning, learning and we're not growing and we're not becoming the people that we're destined to be. Exactly. And we're not special. Like, yes, we are all special, but we're also all the same person and also living a human experience, right? We're living this experience and we think that our purpose has to be different than our friends. No, right. but like our purpose is just to... Be you and whatever that is, it's like, don't shy away from it because that's what makes you unique. That's what makes people think that their purpose needs to be something better or bigger than somebody else's. It's just like, actually, it's actually, you know, the purpose in itself is just staring at you right at the, in the mirror. Like you just have to look at it. Yeah. You don't have to change the fucking world. You just have to live a life that's fulfilled and happy. And and show by example, not by just talk, you know? Oh, I love that. So much good stuff in this episode, Cheryl. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on and being so vulnerable with us. Can you tell everybody where they can find you, where they can do the podcast, like all the things? Yep. Um, I have a podcast called Burke in the Game. Um, iHeart Radio produces it. You can find that anywhere you listen to podcasts or my website, Cheryl dash Burke at dot com cheryl burke was taken whoever <laughs> took that give it back um and then my social media is just at cheryl burke or tiktok is at cheryl burke official because also there's another cheryl burke so please give that back as well no i'm kidding but I yeah anyway thank you so much i had so much fun thank you i yeah. you're like my new soul sister Seriously. i can't wait to uh, go salsa dancing and i'm just can't thankful wait to, to uh, all about javier have you in my life <laughs> bye guys bye <laughs> I want to thank Cheryl so much for coming on and being so vulnerable and sharing her heart with us. I think she is such an incredible woman and I'm so glad that we have been able to connect. I can't wait to go salsa dancing and have her make me look like a fucking amateur. And please go check out her podcast, Burke in the Game, and uh, follow along with her dancing journey. 
As always, make sure you are subscribed so you never miss an episode. Keep up with us on Instagram at FML Talk Podcast. If you need more FML in your life, I have got you covered. You can go to patreon.com slash FML Talk. There are five full seasons of mini bonus episodes, and that's where all the tea really is that I can't talk about on air. I love you guys. I will see you all next week. Have a self-love cocktail on me. Cheers. Cheers.